always say, I always talk about stuff before I get into the message. And you're right, especially this morning, okay? And, um, and, and it's like I've been just been, you know, what, what, does, what does preaching do? What, why, why do we spend this amount of time every week? Um, I know it gets me into the word. I know that I benefit from it. But it's really kind of you all if that's why you come here, just for my sake, you know. Uh, I hope that it has benefit for you. And I hope that our hearts are open, that it's not like, well, I wonder what Glenn's going to say today, you know. Is he going to be good or not? Is he going to be harebrained or wise, you know? Is he going to be, because it's like, so, so it's like, I, I wonder if you could commit to God this morning that God is big enough to use these next minutes to speak into your heart, despite what I say. One of the coolest compliments you get as a preacher is when somebody comes up to you and says, the Lord spoke to me and this is what he said. He used your message. And inside I'm like, well, thank you very much. And then it's like, check the notes. I don't remember saying that, you know. And, and, and it's like somehow the Holy Spirit spoke and used it and ministered to you, and that's awesome. That's the best kind of message in Sunday morning, you know. I, I, my concern is that, that when you tend to say this is a good message is when you get reinforced on what you already believe. Instead of when you get confronted with something new that God wants to lead you into. Now that takes trust and that takes courage. To believe that God has more for you that is leading you into unknown. That there's revelation, that there's explanation that he wants to give to you that, that isn't fully fulfilled with what you already know. Are you courageous enough... I mean, to, to allow God to do that. Are you courageous enough to even think that that could even happen when I'm the one that's up here speaking, you know? Um, that's, Lord God, would you speak to us in that way? Would you bring that kind of Holy Spirit speaking into our midst? We would say and declare, yes, you are the truth. We would speak and declare and say, yes, Lord, that you are speaking to us. And, and, and it's like, especially in this time, that it's not only like I'm not only trying to get a blessing from God to reinforce where I'm at. Because look around you, I mean, in, in your life. Do you want to stay where you're at? Or do you want new revelation? Do you want new revelation? That's not like, I mean, this is not just, I mean, that's like, Revealed from the word of God because the Holy Spirit of God is speaking through it. So God, open our lives to that. So that we're trusting you, so that we're hearing from you, and that we're not basing what we're hearing upon the latest TV evangelist or YouTube preacher or whatever, but that the foundation is like, is this bringing alive the scriptures? Is this following the theme of what God is really revealing in this book. That's my goal and that's my heart. It's my commitment to you. That that's what I'm speaking from. And of course, praise God for his grace. That fills in and blesses and is at work in ways beyond what we could do. It, it was a good word. Okay. I'm looking for the title and it's not there. So listen closely. Okay. So a new short series this morning. And it seems like. I'm in this thing where it's like I'm, I'm, there's these questions that I know that we're kind of asking or symbolically asking. And so we did that series, How Would Jesus Vote? This one is, are we living in the last days? And sometimes I'll hear that question and we'll be talking about that with each other. And depending on what your prior uh, uh, Christian experience has been, you... Depending on what your prior Christian experience has been, you've never heard that question before. You don't know what it means. 
or you have a very specific understanding of what it means, and you know the answer is yes. And so let's talk about that this morning. And so the full title of what I want to talk about is, are we living in the last days? Yes, no, maybe. Okay? So I'm going to get it right, okay? Because I'm answering it all three ways. You with me this morning? Okay? Yes, no, maybe. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that affirmation there, okay? Well, we'll talk into that in just a bit. All right? So first of all, it's like you just hear this without a context. Is this the last days? It's like, well, what does that mean, you know? Are we expecting nuclear war? Are we expecting a meteor to hit the earth? Are we expecting, you know, climate change to, 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 to just wipe us out? And, or, or, or it's like, are we talking about something else? Well, the Bible in various places has a lot of prophecy. It, there's some, sometimes there's whole sections of it. Sometimes it's this verse is just sort of encoded language that's built within something else that, that is being spoken to us. But there's these times where God's voice is speaking and he's letting us know that there's these things that are to come. And so he did that all throughout the Old Testament to predict that he himself, his son, would come and be here. And be in this physical body. But you know, a lot of people missed it, right? They didn't get the prophecies. It wasn't like, oh yeah, well you know, I'm, in fact, it was like they thought they were following the prophecies. And the way they were understanding the prophecies was blinding them to catch what was really happening. The people who knew the scriptures best the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the teachers, they were the ones that were missing most when the Messiah actually showed up among them because they had a preconceived idea of how the prophecy worked. They thought that the prophecy showed them the whole picture and that the way that they could think about the prophecy and interpret it was exactly the only way that God would do it. You see, the fallacy in that kind of thinking. If if, if God is limited to the options in my brain, pity you. If he's limited to the options in your brain, pity me. Right? That God, I mean, it's, yeah, you know, God needs to be working above your and my IQs. By definition of God, he is, okay? So no worries there, right? Right? But that means that there's options that God has that you've not thought about and that I've not thought about. Verse comes to my mind. No eye has seen or, you know, or ear has heard that, 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 that what God has in store and what's planned. Even with these prophetic words, prophetic words, Paul says, the prophecies that we have is like peering through a darkened glass. Do you ever see, you know, this, this nice limousine go by and it's like, ooh, that looks like somebody important is riding in there. But you can't see in because the glass dark, right? It's like prophecies like that. It's like a little, a little flash of light that gets you in there, that gives you hope and says there's something that is to come, but it's not the full picture. It's not like, okay, I'll live by that prophecy, but it's like because of that prophecy, I'll dig into what the Spirit of God is doing right now in this time. I have to get into the Word. I have to hear His scriptures. I have to pay attention. I have to rest in His presence. I have to fellowship with other believers. I have to know what I'm hearing and sensing according to what you're hearing and sensing because the Spirit of God shows up among us. And His revelation to us happens as we gather together, the Bible says, when we're gathered together, there the Spirit of God shows up among us. It's a deeply held value that we interpret and hear the word of the Lord as we're gathered in community together. So this prophecy becomes part of that. Prophecies are like you go down the highway and it says, you know, in 15 miles you'll get to Annapolis. Or in 30 miles you'll get to this you know, and, and, and so it's, you're, you're not there. It doesn't show you. It, I mean, there's, it's not a billboard of the whole city. It's just like it's coming. And the other thing is like when you're in prophecy, you're, 
you're talking about events that are not yet, or you're talking about things that God will do. And God lives outside of time, right? So you're getting a glimpse of something that's outside of time. Therefore, timing is really difficult to get in prophecy. And in fact, that is what really messed up the Jewish scholars. Because what they didn't get was that some of the prophecies, some of the words that were spoken about this Messiah that was to come would happen at a certain time, and others of them would happen at a different time. I don't have these scriptures written out, and we don't have them up here anyway, but, but it's like in Isaiah 61, it says, Isaiah, Old Testament prophet, right? Before Jesus comes, it, it, it says, Isaiah's prophesying, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me to preach good news to the poor, to release the captives, to set the oppressed, the prisoners free, and says, and to proclaim the day of favor of God and that his vengeance is coming. My own generalized words, okay? Then in Luke 4, if you want to document this, Jesus is in the synagogue of his hometown. And it's like, well, here's this nice young rabbi. Let's give him a chance to speak this morning. And Jesus... Uh, comes to the front and, and, and begins to read from Isaiah 61. And it's recorded for us in Luke 4, in the gospel. It's talking about Jesus. And so Jesus reads this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's going to preach good news. He's going to set the prisoner free. He's going to release the oppressed. He's going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stops. And he says, today this is fulfilled. And he misses the last phrase that says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Because that phrase was for the future. That wasn't what Jesus was doing when he was here on the earth in his physical body. Jesus was working in this phrase, was like, mercy triumphs over judgment. If your enemy hungers, feed him. Don't kill him. Don't malign him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. That was the ethos of Jesus. And that's what we're called to live in now as well. So, so there's all these ways as we look into the end time. So, so the scripture is clear that, that what Jesus accomplished when he was here in his body on earth is part of what his commission on this earth is to do. And now he's working through his spirit with us, the church. And someday he's going to return again. And all kinds of people are convinced they know exactly how it's going to happen. And some people know it's going to exactly happen like this. And other people know it's exactly going to happen like this. And other people say, oh, you're both wrong. It's going to exactly happen like this. God bless you all. We're seeing through a glass darkly. You know what we know for sure? It's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. And it's okay to talk about that and study that. But will you keep it in the realm that this is looking into a glass darkly? And that it really isn't the most important thing to talk about when we're talking about how we should live our lives today. So here's the question. Are we living in the last days? Which means the last days before Jesus makes his next physical appearance in his body. We're going to look at a scripture in a bit in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus ascends to heaven and then there's these two angel dudes there that are saying, and someday he'll come back, you know, that shuttle will return. Whatever that shuttle was that lifted him up to heaven, it's going to return and bring him back, right? Someday in, in that way. So we're looking for that, so we're expecting that. So are we living in the last days? And I want to ask you, why are you asking? Are you asking so that you can, because you want to make sure you repent of your sins before he comes back. But you don't want to do it too soon because you'll feel you'll miss out on a lot of this world's fun. 
See? Because your thought is, this Christian life looking in from the outside is boring because y'all got to just sit in church and hear Glenn's talk. It's like, I want to go, but I want to get to heaven, so I want to repent before. But if I could just do it the day before, that would be the best of both worlds. So if you are thinking that, then I want to say to you, is the Lord going to return soon? Yes, he is. Sooner than you might expect. So repent. Get right with God. If you're thinking, well, I know that he has an assignment for me. He wants me to build a relationship with my Muslim neighbor and find the opportunities and pray that I can witness about who Jesus really is as a son of God. But that, I, I don't want to do it. I'd rather watch Netflix. It's like... Then yes, he's coming soon. Don't waste any more time. You're in the last days. Do it. But if you're asking because you say, you know what? I think it'd just be glorious when Jesus comes back that I'm standing on the top of the highest point on the highest mountain in the area that I could be the first one to see him. Then it's like, no. He's not coming soon. Don't do that. If you're thinking, well, if he's coming back soon, then I can quit my job and I can spend all my money and I can have sort of this little party time and can do that. Then no, don't do that. Don't frivolously spoil your retirement account if you have one. Don't give up your job. Don't do that. Live each day responsibly. If you're saying, well, I just want to know what the scripture says. Is Jesus coming back soon? Then I want to answer it this way. It may be. He may be returning real soon. The fascinating thing is that in every generation, they think they're in the last generation. God's spirit has this way, not of brainwashing us, but of creating situations of, of, of that I remember as a boy, I would pay attention to grown up things. I remember my dad having these conversations, this would have been like in the 1970s or something like that. Yes, we did have electricity and telephones and cars and all that for you young people there. It's not that long ago, okay? So, so in the 1970s or late 60s, and, and my dad would talk to his friends, and he's like, wow, I can't see how this earth would get much worse. There's just so many bad things happening already, and oh my, 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 my. And it's like, and would you like to go back to the 70s? Wouldn't that be a simpler, easier time? I mean, maybe not. No. For a lot of us, not. <laughs> Thank you for that I <laughs> roll there at Kia that's like, get out of your Lancaster County bubble there, Glenn. You're not a little boy anymore. Forgive me. Okay. So, whatever. That generation, this gen I remember this other guy, one of my dad's friends. He liked to study things, and he fashioned himself a scholar. And, and, uh, and so he like found this verse in the Bible that says, The fig tree will bud, and then all will be fulfilled in that generation. And he's like, ah, oh, the fig tree represents the nation of Israel. And Israel became a nation in 1948. And so a generation is only 40 years at the most. So that means by 1988, Jesus has to return. I think he missed it. He's returned to Jesus. Jesus hasn't returned to the earth by now, okay? So, so it's like, but he knew it was going to happen. He had faith in his heart. And it's like, let me not make too much light of this because it's like we want to see Jesus, right? We want to be face to face. Could we be so fortunate? But Jesus has a heart for everybody. The word of God says his patience is to give the world a chance to reconcile with him to repent, to get right. It's to give you a chance to be his emissary, his ambassador, to 
willfully and winsomely invite people into a reconciled relationship with God. Let's read um, where some of this is coming from this morning. We're going to look at a more, um, like next week, I think we'll look at Matthew 24, which is where Jesus talks a lot more specifically about events of the end times. Today, let's look into this Acts chapter 1 scripture. Acts 1, beginning of the book of Acts, verse 1. In the first book, I told you Theophilus. Anybody got that name, Theophilus? That's a cool name, man. We just call you Theo. I'm sorry. So I, about, so I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom. Catch that phrase. We'll get back to that. He replied, Jesus, so this Jesus answering, the question is, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Jesus replies, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. So imagine that you're one of these disciples of Jesus. You're following Jesus. You think you're going to become, you know prime minister or one of his officers in his court when he becomes the Messiah king and frees Israel. And then he dies, and all hope is lost. <laughs> and then he rose. What a shock. And, 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 and he keeps showing up among them for 40 days so that they're convinced, so that you've seen him often enough that there's no way that you can years later just be said, was that really real or was I just imagining that? There was enough of people with enough showings that it was very clear and verifiable. These verifyings of living, of seeing Jesus rose again. There's many more uh, recorded examples of that than there is that Julius Caesar ever existed or anything like that. So there'd be much more reason to question a lot of other ancient literature than there is to question this particular fact that there was a Jesus who rose from the dead. And Jesus, so Jesus rose, and, and, and Jesus talked, and when Jesus is talking, he's saying the kingdom of God. Did you catch that? Uh, he talked to them, verse 3, he talked to them about the kingdom of God. And sometimes it's called the kingdom of heaven. Same, same meaning to that term. So, so imagine all the disciples are going through. Their world is shifting in just a few days. And so they're, they're catching up. And so here in verse 6, they come to him. And, and yeah, I'm interpreting between the lines here. But it feels like they're saying, Jesus, really cool feature that you rose from the dead. Cool twist in the story. But now, 
Now will you get on like what we thought you were going to do? Now will you free Israel and restore, what's the next word? Our kingdom. What kingdom was Jesus talking about? The kingdom of God. What kingdom are his disciples still talking about? What makes it good for us, right? You see the difference? Huge difference. And so, and, 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 and so Jesus responds to that. So the question, will you now free Israel, free them from the Roman oppressors, and restore our kingdom? Make it like it was before. Make it like we expect it to be. Jesus says there's a different focus here. It's not for you to know when this will happen. Is Jesus going to come back soon? What's Jesus' answer to that? It's not for us to know. It's for us to be ready. It's for us to expect. It's for us to anticipate. It's for us to pray that he will. It's for us to pray that the world, that people reconcile themselves to so they can be part of the future with Jesus and not stuck in their choice to be alienated from Jesus. Is it possible that the time of when Jesus returns is not determined by a date of our human calendar? See, last night I thought about this for two minutes and I figured it all out. He's going to return on July 7, 2023. It's got to be that way. You know why I know? Because seven's the perfect number. And things come in threes because of the Trinity. So the seventh month, the seventh day, and if you add up 2023, it adds to seven, okay? So it's got to be that way, right? Okay, so now we know first it's CCF. Do you want to write the book or shall I? <laughs> You'll write the foreword and say, and I hope your foreword says, don't believe a word in this book, okay? Yeah, okay. So we're, and, 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 and so I imagine that whenever somebody comes up with a, with, with a prediction like that, that, that the God's up there saying, well, son, we've got to cross that date off the list because we can't let them be right. You know, it's like, sorry, God, messed it up. No, you're not to know the date. It's, it's, it's God lives in this progression of events. He wants to see this culminating of the world be reconciled back to himself. When will Jesus come back? When he sees that that has happened in sufficient measure. Matthew 24, 14, where we'll get to next week, it says that the gospel, first of all, has to be preached to the whole world, to every ethnic group. Do you know what that implies? You can help influence the date. You can help influence how soon he'll return by how much you're engaged in crossing cultures and helping to send others or going yourself to see that people who've never heard of Jesus have an opportunity to do so. If you really want him to return soon, let's deepen our involvement in going to invest in people who've never heard the gospel of Jesus whether they're in the next community over from you or whether they're in a country on the other side of the world. That's one of the factors that determines when Jesus will get back. Now, I think that's pretty exciting, but I feel like for some of you, I'm disappointing you this morning because I'm not telling you all these gory details of this war is going to be like this and that's going to be like that and this calamity is going to happen but then it can't happen because of this and it's, all, it's like, it's like I, I, I just, this is one of the clearest scriptures about Jesus' return in the whole Bible. Jesus speaking to himself and says, it's going to happen after everybody has this opportunity. It's not for us to know when it will happen. So Jesus says, I don't even know. And so Jesus is saying, that's on the Father's job description to determine when. Here's your job description. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit to be my witness 
everywhere you go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When you're doing that, you're helping to bring the return of Jesus faster than what it would otherwise be. When will Jesus return? It depends upon you and upon me. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the way that you reveal yourself to us. Thank you that your gospel is a gospel that is full of your grace, full of your patience, wanting all of us to come into a reconciled relationship with you. Lord Jesus, will you use us to speed the day of your coming by being winsome, fruitful witnesses of you now and as long as we draw breath. In Jesus' name.